Wait, let me kill my music. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm, I'm just killing, oh, okay. the, I'm killing, I gotcha. the, killing the music and, and coming. Oh, shit. Every, what? Uh, I clicked the wrong button. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> I think we should have a whole, uh, we should have several cafes. Am I on mute? No, oh. I can hear you. Okay. I think we should have several cafes on uh, artificial intelligence, which uh, I'm, I'm, I'm moving towards a very negative view on it. Uh, uh, mm. Well, I, de I definitely maintain a, a line in the sand of skepticism. But then again, I take Marshall McLuhan's thing that artificial intelligence is just an externalization of our own nervous system. Well, that only takes it so far. But that's as far as I want to go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and at some point, it takes over. Yeah, it and over. yeah, and but most people don't even recognize that boundary. You know, they're just interacting without understanding. You know, your nervous system is interacting with this ex extension of yourself. Well, but yeah, this. These screens, and the, I, I've coined a new acronym, FAT, yeah. which is Facebook, Apple, Alphabet, Amazon, and Twitter. <laughs> They're going to take over. And they, they mm -hmm. can't even explain what the hell is going on. But it moves in a direction of, like you said, it uh, reinforces, uh, you know, things in the brain. And pretty soon, uh, not, I don't know, pretty soon, within 100 years, uh, human beings <laughs> are gonna be aren't going to exist. Just Aren't like they, a lot of the animals that they caused to extinct. To there, go there's Marco, Marco and his ilk are going to be happy because they're all just going to be this consciousness floating around in, in space. Well, if you don't mind me recommending, I just recently read a really good book called Speaking Into Air by uh, John Durham Peters. And it, it talks a lot about this. You might find it interesting because it goes, it, it's actually subtitled A History of Communication. And it goes back 100 years back to William James. And, you know, when, when the, uh, the telegraph, the telephone, where all this came online. And I'll just kind of bullet point, but it, one of his points, and I think it goes to your point, is the breakdown is communication, the way I understand it, is we don't want to acknowledge there's a gap as long as there's a self in other. The gap where? The gap in communication, the breakdown of communication is not acknowledging you're different than me as much as we're two human beings that have similarities, we're different. And well, we have... Go ahead. And because of that, and because of our life experiences, it's not that we can't learn to communicate, but his emphasis is on, we have to acknowledge that we're all kind of part of the technology is we're all broadcasting, but we forgot. We also are receiving. And are you taking responsibility for the way you receive the information? Uh, yeah, I just, uh, I just left my, uh, session with my psych girl oh you do it over the zoom or Skype? no 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 oh we do it face to face oh good i didn't know i see i didn't that was a misunderstanding on my part the way it's it for for me and i think she agrees that that is that is the ultimate communication is face to face two people in a in a small enclosed area with no distractions right well and yeah. and, 
Uh, and yeah, that's my preferred communication. But well, you, yeah. you can't do you can't do that. It's just she can, but that's her profession. And well, then, it's, a, it's an interesting book because he's trying to, it, at the same time, saying we've gone through all this new age communication, and he is trying to say that we need to value the body, the embodiment of as being a part of communication because with a lot of this technology it's caused it to be disembodied okay yes but yes. i also understand him saying that that disembodiment in a way still takes place when we're face to face just by how we are different and organize our thoughts and feelings so he it, wow. it's interesting how he ties it together he goes far out and that by the end of the book he's bringing it in and what i like basically because my love of communication is and where i'm at the gap is where the juice happens and it's and to get past this idea that communication can't have misunderstanding that's actually part of the communication is acknowledging there's not going to be one perfect fusion of <laughs> when we communicate but we can get close to at least you know like we're doing right now mark you yeah. know yeah does that uh, make sense yes it makes it excuse the word perfect sense to me which is part of what uh my psych girl and i are are you know working working through uh face to face mm -hmm. oh cool uh, it, yeah all of this all of this stuff uh, yeah and yeah, you know, we're about three feet apart or, right. and, and we, we talked about that, that very thing that it's, it's so different. Uh, we were referencing a telephone conversation I had mm -hmm. uh, and comparing it to the ability to uh, there's more to communication than the words. Mm -hmm. But of course, this, this cafe, I'm going to try and focus on writing. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and, and why we write as okay. opposed, uh, but yeah, I just left what I consider a, the highest form of communication. Good, good for you. I'm glad that you're experiencing that. That's good. Well, so she, because I pay her. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now you just now you just cut me off. <laughs> oh, forget it. Uh, well, now you put it in perspective. Thank you. <laughs> God, you can't even do something nice without bringing up money. Well, kind of makes the world go around the these days. <laughs> exactly. Is that not the world we live in? <laughs> um, I'm not saying it's the world we live in, but that's not the sum total of the world. <laughs> no, no, I'm with you on that, Michael, but still. <laughs> I, uh, I have a pet peeve with everything's about money. <laughs> well, I, yeah, no question it's not. And, and part of what we're, we're, again, the bridge, the gap between writing and communication there is a dollar component uh what for each letter that you can write out no for who reads your stuff <laughs> <laughs> i just want to be clear if if you're getting paid by the letter the sentence or what some people do i just had a uh a, you know an advertisement pop up. I I can't even. Was it Facebook or something? Some writing seminar where, you know, it's three week, uh, three days. You know, weekend typical seminar thing. Five thousand dollars includes uh, food and lodging and someone to read your manuscript, and uh, you know. Don't get me started on, on 
Okay, um, write, I, I, I don't well, want to get you. We might, we might get there with writing and, and, and money. Okay. And, and, uh, we could, yeah, if we deviate, I'm capable of going down any rabbit hole you can bring up. You're sure that's not a gopher hole? Hmm. I think we prejudice. No, we're talking. Rabbit. We're talking uh, the rodents. Arrow, yeah. <laughs> white rabbit. The yeah, rodents. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. Right. I can. I can. I can go damn near anywhere. Oh, well, I've seen you go damn near anywhere. I've been in a few sessions with you. You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but you know, I think I do. I've had an Maybe. uncle or two like you. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Uh, Sight Girl and I were debating, you know, if openness versus rigidity. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. We had a few chuckles. Okay. Which is, which is my goal. Make- <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I do like when you laugh and you smile. You have a good smile. Well, that's yeah. That's part of it. That's part of the, the thing. And you know, I, I, you know, that's my that's my that's why I pay her to see if I can crack her. <laughs> <laughs> stone right. face. Stone Better face, than going to the movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we. It's it's fun for me. It's a uh, peak experience, if you're familiar with that. Oh, I grew up in the '60s. I know about a lot about peak experiences. <laughs> <laughs> okay, of, of a so, variety. So, I don't know, Marco. Make the call. When do we officially start? Well. I, uh, there's no official starting point. The camera is rolling from the moment you, you start talking. To the <laughs> Even if you're sitting there picking your nose or whatever, you, whatever, you, whatever you're listening to, it's all on tape. Uh, so I'd say we've begun. But you did propose a um, uh, agenda of sorts. Uh, you would start mm-hmm. off with some remarks. You invited us to answer some questions. So uh, why don't we pick that up? Um, Johnny might join us. I don't. I don't know. Sometimes he has other things um, that he does. Um, so, uh, so if he does, he'll 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 you know just just. Well, okay, whatever. okay. I'll I'll jump in because I, I I'm sure we're not going to have enough time. But uh, so the the topic is the perfect word, and I I just came up with it really as a pushback to Jeffrey's quantum field poetics. So is, is there such a thing as the perfect word? And my goal in this little session, well, you know, I used to teach a class in writing, is to move writers from what I call wannabe writers who won't write towards the person who writes. So I'm going to, I'm going to speak about some things, then we'll do an exercise and then we'll open it up to uh, whatever. With I'm having audio trouble with with Katrina. I can't. Never mind. I, I heard it. I heard it. She, uh, do we need pen and paper? She asked. <laughs> that's up to. That's totally up to you. I mean, <laughs> uh, and, and I'm not opposed to if you need clarifications. I don't know. Raise your hand or something, and then speak. But like I like I was talking to Mike and Ed. If you bring up something, I can go down a rabbit hole and wind up in Florida, you know, or wherever. Uh, so anyway, I wanted to 
speak briefly about the four books I listed and why I listed them. Well, there's three books and one essay. The, the essay uh, by George Orwell, which is, uh, I think, it was 1946 or something he wrote it, but his book 1984, interestingly enough, is quote, or used as evidence on both the, the liberal side and the conservative side. They both try and use it as proof that they are right, uh, which is why I listed that. And it was just a brief essay. Everybody could read it. And then the book, Why Sex Matters, uh, speaks to a lot of what Jeffrey was talking about in that it's a biological sort of history of life starting from the, the mo molecular level on up to the current crisis we face today. And it's just a excellent book. Of course, very few people have read it. So, and then, and then I mentioned Infinite Jest because I think it's a great example of perfect words being put together, but then the, the, the outcome, the product is far from perfect in that many people who start to read it never even finish it. So it can hardly be called a perfect, perfect, uh, uh, gathering of, of words. And then finally, Maps of Meaning by Jordan Peterson. Uh, and this goes to sort of writing, why, why we write. I saw a, a recent interview with him when he was talking about the book. And he wrote the book, uh, I think it was in uh, 1999. And it took him 12 years to write. And he actually said this and then defended it, that it was an accurate statement that he wrote each sentence in the book 50, five zero times, trying to get it Perfect. And so I, I'm going to read just a, a paragraph of, of that book. I, I'd like to read uh, little pieces of, of, of all of these books and some others. Uh, and at the same time, I w I'd like you to keep in mind uh, the five W's who, what, why, where, and when, which is the story, and then the elements of a story, which is the title, plot, setting, character, race, characterization, the style, voice, and the big ideas and themes. Uh, and then I'm going to talk briefly about why I write, tell you why I write, and the five best books, my personal five best books. And uh, then it'd be nice to go around the table, as it were, and for all of you to list your five books. If, if you haven't read, if you don't have five best books, that speaks to their, the lack of perfection. Uh, but a poem would be okay. My favorite poem is If by Rudyard Kipling, and there's reasons for that. Uh, and, and then, I'll, yeah, I'll tell you my five best books, and then I'll stop. We'll go around the table. Everybody will uh, write down maybe 
your five best books. We'll see if there's any overlap. You can elaborate why you like them if, if you want. You don't have to. And then uh, it'd be nice to hear why you write. I, I think, well, I don't know about Ed if he's writing. Uh, but again, my goal is to move, to move you towards writing as opposed to just thinking about writing. So let's see. All right, where should I start? Why, why Sex Matters is a nonfiction scientific book uh, written in, in 2000 before the year, before the uh, terrorist attack, 9-11. And the author is, is deceased now. Uh, and she writes in the approach of, of behavioral ecology, uh, which looks at the, the human condition. She goes, well, she goes back to the, to molecules and atoms and traces the, the, how human beings became who they are. There are certain assumptions uh, in that, and some people will take exception to those assumptions uh, because she's a, a evolutionist, a evolutionary, yeah, not really psychologist, but, a, but she does study the human condition. It's full of research, all, all, all the current recent search and the, and the basic, I get the big idea of this story is, is that human beings are, we reproduce sexually and sexual reproduces, reproduction allows for variance in the offspring. And I, I, I'm not going to go into how, how that manifests itself, but it does in differences, differences between people, races, genders, everything. And it all stems because there's a, a sperm and an egg and, and that hasn't changed since well, it's the beginning of sexual reproduction. And that allows for variability in, go ahead, Marco. Well, I, I just, I wanted to ask, because even before you go into each, each particular book, um, what, what, the, what the relation is between the biological arguments or the evolutionary biology and, um, and the the literature, the, the the words. Is there something in your mind that ties these because ties the different books together? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Because the reason there the reason there is no perfection, perfect word, perfect book, whatever, is because of the variability. We are different. And and I know I'm a sort of contrary to the group in that you you you're positing a position that there's a collective consciousness above and beyond uh, human uh, existence, and and I'm pushing back against that, and and. This is for another cafe, but I was talking to Mike earlier that I'm becoming more and more negative towards artificial intelligence. Uh, I think it, it, it's, it's uh, the road to hell. <laughs> this is paved with good intentions. <laughs> Uh, and we are where we are because of 
sexual reproduction and the differences that 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 allows in a species which allows the species as a collective group but a small group because they are so different they can survive any hazard or threat that comes into the, the attacks the group uh, a pathogen a a uh, virus a parasite if 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 the group has variants some will survive and and the more you move towards what's it and pardon my pronunciations homogeneity sameness a collectiveness you become vulnerable to uh attack and now we're getting we're going down a rabbit hole <laughs> artificial intelligence is moving in the direction that it's going to overtake humans and it's going to be and and you may get your zoos fear all right let, let's just to pull back from the rabbit hole. So I, I want to understand your uh, your uh, reasoning for the way you're framing the you know the, the books and everything. So pushing back against the quantum poetics, I, the, an idea that you picked up from the quantum poetics discussion last time that there is the possibility of a of a perfect word, and if I understand the cor- connection you're making, the perfect word would be. Uh, a kind of homogeneity. It would reduce the diversity that comes through in in the biological domain, sexual reprodu- reproduction that creates, you know, variability in offspring, which increases the resilience of the group. Is is that so? So That's, you want to say something about literature or writing uh, that connects with that idea? That the, yes, that the the striving for perfection in your writing can be a barrier to progress to you as an individual moving forward. It's a, it, it's of as convenient to s- s- get wallowed uh, in searching for perfection. It's a nice little out as opposed to keep going. Making hay keep, and letting the words fly. And, and then you can, yeah, because I, I'm going to offer evidence today that there is no such thing as a perfect product. Okay. Okay. So, and the AI is a way of optimizing for some kind of perfect product, which... You're, you're seeing as counter to the best interests of the species, which would benefit more from a lot of, a lot of, I'm just want to, I just want to get your argument. That's all because you're this, because you're framing this as a counter argument. So I yes. want to make sure we're clear that this is not just a literary, you know, uh, uh, discussion. Uh, there, there's some point being made or attempting, uh, attempted to be made. Yeah, and to to me to me it's obvious, but, uh, you know, as a uh, you know, as a reader, writer, observer, teacher for fifty some years, a lot of people are comfortable not finishing what they started because of the the the, the fear of or the anxiety of not producing a perfect product. And I, there's one thing for, there's one thing for an engineer. Uh, uh, you know, if you're, if you're doing, if you're trying to go to the moon and I may, that may be an aberration. We were damn lucky to get there. <laughs> and, and I, nobody's returned. I mean, or you're building a bridge. You want perfection. But when you're talking about words and writing 
Ed, you're shaking your head. Speak. I had to unmute first. Um, en engineers don't seek perfection. They seek functionality because every engineer knows that whatever he makes, it's going to fail at some point. Everything fails. So you, you in one sense, an engineer is aware of producing failure, but that doesn't stop you from doing what you're doing because um, in the engineering world, it is good enough. It, it gets the rocket to the moon and it gets the capsule back. The, the bridge, we just saw this in Genoa. You probably didn't get that over there, but a, a major bridge in Genoa, Italy collapsed. I saw that. Yeah. Um, because it hadn't been maintained. Because that's also part of what we do when we engineer things. So I, I, I think that it's a little off course to, in that analogy, because it's, it's per engineers are perfectly aware of the fact that it's not perfect. Well, I think we're saying the same thing, actually. Well, I, well, I agree with a lot of what you're saying, but for many very different reasons. <laughs> well, well in, in that, like you said, the engineer goes forward. Yeah. He goes forward. And, and my argument is in, in writing, and I'm talking about writing, which is an expression mm -hmm. of, of one's self, that seeking perfection, the perfect word, is a barrier, it stops you from going forward. But Jordan Peterson rewrote every sentence in that book 50 times. And now he's a best-selling, hugely successful author, and people love his book. So as the painstaking, you know, as painstaking as it was, it seems to have been worth it, at least in, in that case. Yeah, I'll, I'll respond to that. In, in, in that, the original book, Maps of Meaning, I don't know, I'm, I'm just, I have no idea, but maybe it sold a thousand copies and, and it, it garnered him nothing. But what it did was because he took his thoughts and took the time to put them on paper, it, it eventually paid off in a self-help book. And, and there was a confluence of events. And now the guy, yeah, is super successful, a millionaire, one of the, one of the most potent voices in, in the, at least the Western world. So, and if not for the, the pain, he, he pain state he took in writing maps of meaning, he couldn't go on and do all these interviews and have his rap down and just be like, pretty much think on his feet because he spent 12 years formulating his ideas. Not to say that his, that I believe or think all his ideas are correct, but he's, he's very good in now the meat, the medium, the on-screen, you know, instant, and he's got his wrap down. And, and, and I'm going to read, I'm going to read, well, I'll do it now. What the hell? Uh, this is from Maps of Meaning. This is on page 13. And let me tell And it, okay, according to him, he rewrote this sentence 50 times to get the perfect word. Now, I know what it means, but I am betting it confuses most people. Here's the, here's the sentence. Active apprehension of the goal of behavior conceptualized in relationship to the interpreted presence serves to constrain or provide determinant framework for the evaluation of ongoing events, which emerge as a consequence of current behavior. <laughs> I might have to read that 50 times. <laughs> yeah. No, no kidding. And imagine 500 pages of that. 
So if his if his if his goal was to construct the perfect argument with the perfect words, he failed. But you know, twenty five years out, it's paid big dividends. <laughs> And and you know who know, who knows you know five years from now it feels you know what I think it's a question of faith then because and um, maybe a mixture of faith and obsession. Uh, I'll read. Let me share some words from a book we're reading in another discussion. It's uh, Octavia Butler and. This is the very, very, very beginning of Parable of the Sower. Uh, and this takes place in, the, in 2024. But these... Uh, is it, so it's a novel? It's a novel by Octavia Butler. It's part of uh, what was intended to be a trilogy, Parable of the Sower, Parable of the Talents, and then in the third book she didn't finish writing, Parable of the Trickster. Uh, but it's interesting because <laughs> it, um, it follows the life story of um, a, a, uh, an, indi- an individual, a young black female in a dystopian future America who um, invents a new religion. She calls it Earthseed. And she writes these verses that encapsulate her ideas of what she thinks is most true and most important to communicate in this context of survival and struggle. And so finding the right words um, maybe or, or maybe not the perfect words. I mean, I think that's part of the, the what is interesting to me about this, uh, this discussion uh, is paramount to the success, not only of her, of her work on, in a literary sense, but to her survival. So it's, I think, a way of, to me, to, I'll read the words, but I think it's a way of highlighting like what is at stake in, in the right words. So she writes, and this is the very beginning, prodigy, prodigy, that's an interesting word, I thought, uh, is at its essence, adaptability and persistent positive obsession. Without persistence, what remains is an enthusiasm of the moment. Without adaptability, what remains may be channeled into destructive fanaticism. So adaptability is important too. Without positive obsession, there is nothing at all. And so I think that there's, I want to already push back on the pushing back because I think that there's an argument, a strong argument to be made for that obsessive quality when you're trying to find the right word, especially if it feels that it's essential that you do because what you have to communicate is so potent, so important, um, so significant to your community or to the wider, you know, to the, the other that is going to read your words that even even if nobody gets them at first, even if you have to you know labor over them over and over and over, and for years nobody pays attention, there's that element of faith and or obsession that um, has to go into it, <laughs> even if despite whether whether or not even if it might fail yes and and, and so I, I think that I mean. But I want to champion like that, that, that helping find the right words is important. And the good enough word, well, the, the almost their words or the kind of the, the mediocre words or the, it's like the bridge that will fall down. <laughs> you know, you don't want your, you want to create that bridge intellectually or spiritually or emotionally or relation, relationally, and you want it to be sturdy. <laughs> Okay, my point is, though, to to go forward with your thinking and put it on paper, and it's not going to be, the finished product is not going to be the first product, but you're never going to get there if you, if you let the, the quest for the perfect word or the perfect sentence stop you from from plowing forward what it, I, if people i don't 
writing, one of my, my tenants is writing is thinking. Everybody, their minds go and they think they got it all figured out and they got a story or whatever they're going to. Okay, that's great. Believe me, everybody has one, almost everybody. So put it on paper and, and from the first page to the last page, just keep going. Now, I'm not saying there aren't other methods taught, but keep going because the, the finished product is not the finished product. It's like uh, uh, Peterson. He thought he thought he had it all figured. You know, maps of me, the greatest thing ever. And people just like, <laughs> what is this guy talking about? And now, twenty five years later, it, it's if you, uh, I don't know, if you're building a brick wall, if you're uh, a mason, you're not going to be an expert mason. You know, at the beginning. Now you may not have you may that may not suit you, but you'll you'll find out. Not everybody can write. Is that uh, Michael? You want to say something? Yeah, um, I can only speak from the, uh, what you're talking about, the, and having many, and I'm going to use a radical term, miscarriages along the way. That my creativity has to start. What is my intention? Am I writing for somebody else? Am I inspired? Where am I going with this? Because creativity does not get off the ground in my book unless you understand what is this intention that's for me as, as actually burning in your belly. You know, and if you're not clear with that, you're going to set the conditions to continue to miscarry in my book. So I get what you're saying, but it seems like. I, from my point of view, you have to drop beneath that to even start where you're trying to get the people to go. How many people in your class were clear of why they were, you know, the intention for writing? You know it when you meet somebody too. Like, you just know when they have the passion, like even if they're not great at first, that there's a hunger. But I, the intention is a good way of talking about it too. Yeah, it's 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 a for some for some people like I think uh, George Orwell in that essay said he knew from when he was like five years old he wanted to be a writer. Uh, Margaret Atwood, I heard the same thing. She she knew she wanted to be a writer, and and back to Jeffrey's thing, and I question him on this, his 20-year plan. He almost started on third base. He was 29 years old and a PhD, and he wanted to move forward from there. Well, part of the story is how did you get a PhD? Uh, that's not available to Did he have a plan to get a PhD? It sounds like uh, and he's not here, so it's really not fair. But it, but it sounds like he was pushed in directions by a relationship with his mother, and all, you know all these interesting things. And obviously, he has the intellect to, to and the discipline to do what he did. So, that's that's part. Yeah, what is it? What is it? What is your intention? Yeah, people came to the class. Trust me, they all had they had different intentions. <laughs> well, I, I really like the the four great motives of writing that you posted from or from Orwell, just either from sheer egoism, aesthetic enthusiasm, historical impu impulse, or political purpose. And if you look at those just as words, they're not really perfect, um, but once you read what he's intending, um, it, it, I, I'm not a writer, but I, I resonate with pretty much all four of those to some degree, maybe one more than the other. So I, I think 
the motives that he identified there are, are spot on and useful to for someone like me who is not a writer um, to say, well, maybe maybe it's there for me. But just wanted to point that out. I, I felt that to be helpful. What is it with um with writers like writers and modesty? <laughs> because um <clears throat> the same like when I just heard Marco say um, I'm not really a writer. Come on now, Marco. <laughs> I mean, you're you're not only a probably a writer, but you're probably a, you know a damn good one. And um, writers who like I mean, just from what I've read, just just your comment a lot of your commentaries um, on IC and um. You know, when you talk about, I, I completely relate to what you're saying, um, Mr. DeVore, because. You can call me Mark. Mark, okay. <laughs> because um, I'm one of those like um, writers who won't admit that she's a writer and who definitely won't admit that she's a good one. Um, and that's something that I struggle with is I, I, I wish I had taken your class <laughs> like, you know, a decade or so ago because um, that stunted me, this, this, uh, obsession author was saying um with perfection because um i take words very seriously and especially written words and um it's more important to me to be understood to be understood uh through my writing than it is in any other form because i feel like when i'm writing that's when i communicate the best and i have like um stacks of journals you know, in my closet that um, because I felt like the, the time when I was writing the, the best is when I really, when I wasn't really work when I wrote the most is when I wasn't really concerned about perfection. When I was when I was the times when I was really writing, I say writing to myself, but I kept these journals and I was sort of writing to God in these journals, like um, knowing that he was reading them, um, knowing that he, you know, he was reading them and so I was writing to him and telling him you know what how I was interpreting the experience I was or the circumstances I was going through at that particular time in my life and um and if I were to go back and read so when I go back and read some of these journals I don't even recognize <laughs> the person who wrote it um sometimes because I'm thinking wow I was because the words were written it was so much passion and so I mean some of the some of the, the pages have like tear stains on them and stuff. And it's like, and I wasn't, I wasn't worried about perfection at the time, even though I was writing to one whom I considered perfect. Um, I felt like, you know, what was most important to me, because I was writing feverishly when I write in these journals. And I have one like for each year, 20, 2009, 2010, 2011, this is those multicolored composition notebooks. And um, yeah, and, and I feel like that the times when I, but then there were times when I had to sort of like write something that was kind of contrived or when I sat down and said, you know what, that's it. I've decided today's the day. Today's the day I'm going to start being a writer, damn it. And nothing. Because when I sat down and like made that my, made that my intention and, and also because I knew that when I sat down and decided I wanted to be a writer, then I had to think, I immediately thought about my audience. You know, and I'm like, wait a minute, I have to make, first of all, I know what I want to say, but how do I know, I don't know how to say it, and how do I know that my audience is going to get what I'm saying, and just went through this, I went through down a lot of rabbit holes when I'm sat there trying to write, and then I end up with maybe a paragraph, <laughs> if that, um, or just a bunch of blank pages, so I, I really, I, I think it's important, you know, to get over that, if you're trying to, um, if you're trying to write, because you are, you're worried about, for me, unless I was writing to God, um, that that whole issue about, you know, perfect expression and using the right words, and it's only been modeled to me by other writers. I, I, I do disagree with you in that I do think that there are perfect words out there. Um, yeah, I don't know what kind of painstaking effort they went through to produce them and get them out there, but, you know, Thank God for all of us that they got out there because these words have probably have changed a lot of people's lives and you know a lot of inspiration in them. So um, I think that there are perfect words out there. I think with me, my frustration is that I'm not a source. Of, I'm not a source of any of those perfect words. I don't think. Um, and unless I'm writing, unless I'm writing to God, 
otherwise, um, yeah, I, I do struggle to find the perfect words. And I would like to get over that, you know, when I'm writing, because writing has become my most important form of expression. You know, for me, it is. Um, and I, I think that the only time I'm not worried about perfection is when I'm sat, is when I'm, when I'm writing, when I write what I, what I'm, what I think is the truth. You know, when I'm not trying to, when I'm not trying to be a writer or trying to, you know, when I just want to sit down and like those journals probably. Um, I bet you there's some good stuff in there because I wasn't really worried about an audience or getting published or anything. It was just, I got to get this down. I got to get this in writing. Um, because, you know, because writing has, uh, writing for me has a way of making, of, of, of making my feelings more intelligible to other people than if I were just to talk about it or, or what have you. So I agree with you that, yes, um, I don't know if all writers do this, but as a writer, I strive, you know, striving to find the perfect words has been a major barrier for me. And but I um, but and but I disagree with you in that. I don't know if you may, maybe maybe I'm misinterpreting. You said that you know that they're really um, that you should sort of not you should sort of give up, not give up, but not give up. That's not what you said. You should said you said stop focusing on uh you know the perfectionism and just write and just do it okay no i yeah i, I agree with that okay um but i also agree with marco that there are some people who have achieved that feat of getting per the perfect words out there and um i've, I've read some of them i've come across across them because you told us you you said one of the exercises you wanted us to write down five books Five of our favorite books, um, and I managed to do that while I was listening. And when I wrote down my, I never, I didn't think I would be able to, but I just thought about the books that had words in them that 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 inspired me the most. And um, and the words in these books were pretty darn perfect to me. <laughs> I mean, I, I could never, you know, I I could never in a million years produce something like that. Um, and you know, they're perfect because. They defy, they're not just bestsellers for the, because they're relevant to the time and date and the, and the, the culture or whatever, or because they're in demand. Um, they're like, the, these books or these words have had everlasting, like, relevant and appeal. And, you know, their words speak from the grave. And so I think it's possible. Um, and, and, but in some cases, they were divinely inspired, too. You know, I, I think there are cases where words, words that are written, you know, uh, from divine inspiration. Yeah, they're pretty damn perfect. <laughs> I mean, it's like, and I, and I was just thinking about some of the books um, that I put on the, on my list, and I don't know the, the mixture of them, but they're not related in any way like your books are. Um, they just happen to be there at a particular season season in my life, or you know, they gave me a lot, and they provide a lot of inspiration. Some of these books saved my life at the time. Um, and like I said, on IC, it was Paradise Lost. Um, two of them are epic, you know, epic poems, you know, Paradise Lost and The Divine Comedy. Um, I think those are two of my favorites. Um, I love teaching. I love teaching those poems. I love it. Um, <laughs> they're, just, they're just wonderful. And, the, and also and even the circumstances under which they were written. It's amazing, you know. Um, you wouldn't think you would find inspiration in, ex, in an excommunicated prison cell, um, but Dante did, you know. Um, uh, and then, I, so there's the two epic poems, um, also uh, Fountainhead, and I don't like that I included that book because at the time that I read it, I was like in high school, and I was very impressionable. Um, and it had an incredible impact on me. I don't like the book. I no longer like Anne Rand, <laughs> but I was very much into her books at the time. But Fountainhead, have I, I, I like what she had to say about individualism. And for a high school student struggling for acceptance, yeah, the message of the beauty of individualism um, and the trap of collectivism, yeah, that definitely served its purpose for me in high school. Um, that uh, Anne Rand is what got me interested in, in philosophy. So, you know, you got the two epic poems and we got Fountainhead. And then um, the last two, uh, okay, Brave New World by Huxley is just amazing. It's, it's 
it is very prophetic. Um, and then I love, and then the wisdom and poetry books of the Old Testament, which you know would include um, uh, Job and uh, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Proverbs. Yeah, that particular section of the Old Testament, you know, the wisdom, the wisdom and poetry. Hebrew, Hebrew poetry is 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 amazing. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, so I think that those, and to me, you know, for me, those five books had, you know, had, had portions of perfect verbiage in them. And, um, but I could never produce that. And I think that when I sit down to write, you know, I'm using these, I'm using them as like my, my ideal. And I'm like, gosh, can you get that out of your head? You're not, you're not going to be able to write like that. Um, the only, I feel like the, that a big portion, some of those books were divinely inspired. I think that's where the, some of the protection comes from. So do you think it's possible to find perfect words if there's divine inspiration involved? Anyone? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go. Uh, actually, I, I know artists will say that, that they pluck the the singer songwriters the words they just came into their to their head uh, but I'm not of the belief of divine inspiration uh, and part of part of the point was if there were such a thing as perfect everybody would agree but i i almost guarantee you that the six of us with our five best books there might be uh, uh marco and i might both have infinite jest on there but maybe not any others and and so we got six people and we're going to wind up with with you know 25 30 books so if there was such a in in other words one what one person's perfection is not in others and and, and uh, I don't even the the best selling the best selling books are romance novels Nora Roberts Daniel Steele uh so if, if, if it was a democracy and, and okay, that's as close as perfection as you can get, it'd be Daniel Ste and the guy just Patterson just wrote a book with, with former President Clinton. I, I pick these books up in the, in the supermarket and read a page or two just to get a sense of them. Uh, but they, they're not going to make my list. And, and, and and again, infinite jest, I don't know if I'm going to get to reading a paragraph. You cannot open a page and not find unbelievable, perfectly put together words. It's like, how did that dude do that? And yet the book in itself is like, most people don't finish it because it fails on, on many other levels. And yet they, he was obviously a genius. And then he killed himself because he couldn't, he couldn't get out of the trap of perfection writing the Pale King. He just, and, and the guy could put together words like no one. So the, the, the point is, that a collective, a collective mind does not exist. <laughs> I, I, I hear you. I keep hearing you arguing against yourself, Mark. I, I feel like you're going, you're saying you're arguing against perfection, but then you yourself are making the judgment and the distinction between the popular romance novels and, you know, whatever is in the supermarket and infinite jest, which you think is a work of genius and filled with perfection and you know has inspired you i i me too so um i mean I, 
I, th- I don't know. God, um, no. What does no, that have to I'm do with collecting? <laughs> I'm, in, I'm interested in how you think they're opposed. I, I, well, f- one thought is that you, you, earlier you, you made the point that uh, um, uh, about homogeneity. And so do we have to assume that perf- perfection is homogenous? What if it's not? What if that would be imperfect if perf- perfection was homogenous and if everybody agreed that one particular text uh, or the same particular texts are, are all perfect? Maybe part of perfection would be that individuals can be attracted to or even require different forms of, of perfe- perse- perfection that are suitable to their individuality. Um, so that, that just one, just one idea. Um, the other is that I think that, you know, genius, one definition of genius is that, is that it is the channel to divine inspiration, that it is the, the, the portal through which the divine or the transcendent or whatever is beyond the mundane world of cheap romance novels, like by which that comes into the human plane. And so, you know, isn't that worth, isn't that worth striving for? Isn't that worth um, uh, working for even? Because here's the thing about perfect words is that even though um, they may appear to be um, common or, you know, universal in a certain way, they could all actually be very, very difficult to really understand. Like there could be a kind of uh, popularity, like the Bible is a, an example. Uh, it you know is is full of words that people repeat every day in churches and in other you know places of study, worship across the world. But to actually drill down into the real meaning of them requires um, a lot of struggle, a lot of suffering. Um, so it's not for everybody. <laughs> Perfection maybe isn't in that sense isn't for for, for everybody. Michael. Well, it's interesting. We're, we're beginning with a word in itself. Perfect. <laughs> That's a word. And the history of that word, according to Carl Jung, has got a lot of baggage. And the root meaning of it all the way back was wholeness or a matter of completeness. And not without, it didn't in at least originally, according to Young, did not intend, wasn't intended to mean without negativity, without blemish. And it, and and when and he paraphrases some where perfect is used in the Bible, and 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 substitutes the meaning from that word, and <laughs> the way it changes the context is beautiful. You know. Uh, I think we're because we're living in an age of artificial intelligence, uh, a need to function at least in an excellent fashion that we've lost sight and we've been obsessed with perfection and the negative and what I would term the negative sense of not be allowing ourselves to ha- have mistakes and to mo- keep moving forward, keep going, and 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 that is what is perfect, at least from my point of view. The history of words needs to be looked at too, because we definitely aren't using words f- way back. And I think studying the history of words and under and contrasting to now enlarges my understanding and my use because in a sense when somebody uses the word perfect now i just kind of i'm not going to argue the point i i i just feel into it okay you 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 want to put on the perfect face the, you know you don't want no, you don't want to be seen for who you are i get it it's not my job to tell you <laughs> you know or counteract you you're really putting on a phony face. <laughs> if that makes sense. Not my job. No, are you saying um, 
mindful that when people strive, uh, when people uh, strive, not strive for perfection, or when that's their objective, when perfection is their objective, that there's something um, sort of phony or false about it. No, I'm saying that there's a, a feeling tone for people that do it in such a way. It's not perfection. It's a false front. Right. Like there's the eugenics this, movement, huh? eugenic, like, like the eugenics movements, you know, things like that. Like, um, trying I'm not, to, I'm not sure of that word. I'm sorry, Katina. Like I, the eugenics movements when, um, you know, when try, trying to achieve perfection in, in, a, in a race or something. Um, and, and now I, I agree with what you're saying. About per- I never thought of it that way before that. Yeah. Perfection does have a lot of negative connotations. And I think that, um, that, that our culture today has become a little bit obsessed with it or preoccupied with, with perfection. And, and you see it, and I know uh, th- this does in some way relate to artificial intelligence, because even in our technology and in, in, in our um, medical research, we're constantly trying to find, it seems like, you know, we're focused more on trying to come up with programs and with devices to perfect um, human functioning or uh, health um, rather than, you know, curing diseases or or you know, using technology for more noble pursuits. Um, yeah, I, I do think that that's become, uh, a, a, you know, the concept of perfection or the goal of perfection has has become a, a preoccupation with our with our culture. But I don't know if but it's not the good kind of perfection. I don't know if that makes any sense. Wholeness, yeah, that's it's not perfection for the sake of wholeness. Because if they were really if we're, if our culture was really pursuing perfection. For wholeness, it would include the blemishes and the warts and all, and the, you know, it would include everything that it takes to make up um, the sort of the sum and bonum of um, of who you are, or what you are, or whatever idea you're dealing with. So yeah, I think that that. Um, so yeah, I, I think that perfection can have negative, can have um, a negative spin to it. Yeah, and go ahead, Mark. Well, can we? move back to writing as opposed to talking about perfection in the in the abstract uh, the okay so writing perfection what is yeah. that to you what is that to you well what my my point is that there is no such thing what one person considers a, a perfect combination of words, another person won't. Is that okay? And yes. Okay. That's my that's my point. And and this strive <coughs> excuse me. I believe that writing is thinking and back to where I started this. In other words, everybody has all these thoughts, feelings, whatnot going around in their brain. To write is to try and organize that in such a way that it makes sense. And to think that you're going to put something down, that your thoughts and your feelings are going to be perfect and everybody's going to agree that, oh my God, that's <laughs> that it is a fallacy and that inhibits people from actually doing the work of writing and organizing their thoughts and feelings. And and then when you get it where you're somewhat satisfied, then you might put it out there and see if somebody, and see what other people think. And that's that's the dialogue we have. Uh And and perfection is a barrier to... Well... Move it, actually coming together, looking for, looking for uh, consensus on what is great or perfect. Okay, it's not going to happen. Okay, I, I don't disagree with you. I just, I'm just challenging the notion, and I'm actually online with you. People that have that relationship to the notion of perfection. 
yeah, they're doing something wrong and you're right. But why do we have to, you know, it's a word. How, why do we have to, con why don't we challenge the many ways that we can use it? Instead of get like you said, and I take your point, we're locked in and that does interfere with creativity. It does interfere. And, and some of this, you say writing is, is thinking. And I say that reading is listening. And how well can I, how perfect can I be in listening to uh, infinite jest? <laughs> you know, so this notion of perfection cuts across many things. And I have to understand how am I holding that idea? So I don't, a lot of, I don't disagree with you. I just have a hard time with your contraction around it. That word, I don't understand that word. Well, it seems like you're only emphasizing the notion of perfect that gets in the way, and that's fine. But everything you've said as far as continuing forward and, and not letting that idea get in the way, to me, that's part of perfection. In the sense I view perfection, because I can so, see with your eyes, we have a difference of opinion. No, I was tr I, I was trying to to formulate it, understand it, in in and put it into sort of my own words. Okay. In that, in that you, you now I lost it. Uh, I think you're sensing something, though, Mark. I think I mean you're responding to something. Like I, I, I <laughs> yeah, I, I, he is, he is. Uh, I um, agree with you about, and, and I know in myself that I will obsess over the right word or the perfect word, and that's that's what makes me a poet, is that I do that. But it also is what prevents me from writing poetry, because uh, I will fall into rabbit holes and get stuck in, in, in loops. Uh, and the only way I know out of that is to go through it, is just to ac actually get the actually write the damn poem and and then when i do i feel better and things open up and i'm able to move on with my life um but uh, so i think we're in agreement there but i think also you're sensing maybe a stuckness maybe because like you're tuned in to the field like we're all communicating in the cafe and in other forums and there's a train going behind me um, <laughs> So, and, and I think maybe you're respond. I think you're res you're you're res reacting or responding to that, um, but that the argument is a little bit circular because, uh, uh, well, or or or, or it, it, it's. Well, circular. I think it, it, it. I think what you said brought me back to what Michael said and what what clicked with me. I think his point was Michael and and that you believe perfection is in effort as opposed to the finished product. He's muted. If my intent, my intention is to involve myself in, in perfection, I think it's just practical to acknowledge there's an effort and and if I'm not fully online or embracing that effort, I think I fall into your trap. But the the effort in itself will not guarantee the outcome. No, no, I'm not. I'm not. No. No, it's, uh, well, it's, I, it's, I, it's commendable. And and yeah, I have a big problem with people do, who who start obviously who start something and don't see it through, who don't put the effort into what it is. But the effort alone does not guarantee a finish. No, it it doesn't. Uh, but but like uh, uh, John Cage and his his interest in Zen and sound and stuff was a lot about. Watch your intention so that the creativity, the perfection can can come through. You're there, you're part of it, but it's like you gotta sit on the edge and make sure what part you're playing 
but you're not in fucking control. To put it bluntly. We made it 60 minutes without an F-bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. I, 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 get, I get inspired sometimes. That's okay. F-bombs no, no. are allowed. Michael, you did say something earlier that um that I had never thought of before either when it comes to writing. You said that um when it comes to the question of perfection and when writing is thinking, then then you know that then reading is is listening. And um, you know, when you talk about whether words are perfect or not, um, you do have to consider who's receiving the words. Um you know, the mindset, the type of mindset that those words are being filtered through. Um, and in some cases, yeah, depending on the reader, the reader, a, re a lot of readers may not be able, some readers may not be able to grasp or to appreciate the, the, the content or the inspiration behind the words. Um, but I do think that the times when I see, the times when I've come across words, or sorry, times when I felt like the words that I'm writing are sufficient, okay, not perfect, but sufficient. And that means that I'm writing without any interruption. Um, I'm not stopping, I'm not interrupting myself to try to find the perfect word. I'm not looking in a thesaurus, or nothing. I'm just right. That happens, that occurs for me as a writer when, um, when I'm like, when I'm writing the truth. Okay, when I'm telling my story, um, when what I'm writing about, I have, uh, I have, you know, there's something that links me to the experience, and I'm, you know, that I'm writing about, and that's the time when I've seen, when I have felt like, um, I'm, when I'm just writing naturally, um, that 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 my words are sufficient. Okay, I don't know if that means perfect or if that is, you know, the sufficient as in, okay, what I just wrote is exactly what sufficient for me. Okay, what I just wrote is, is, is it, it perfectly resonates what I'm thinking, how I'm feeling, what I'm trying to express. And um, without, without any consideration for the reader. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then, if, and then I find that if somebody does read what I wrote and I thought was sufficient, and um, if they like it or if they think if it's something that's inspiring to them, well, that's secondary. You know, that becomes like a secondary objective for me when I'm writing. Is um, And I think that the times when I've been most obsessed with or held up by uh, uh, this striving for perfection are the times when I'm thinking too much about the reader and too much about, like Michael was saying, almost it's almost like this 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 you get in a situation where you start to encase yourself into this like false image. And when you're thinking more, when I'm thinking more about the image that that I'm projecting through my writing, rather than you know just the words, the words coming from me, what the words reflecting you know me and what and what I know to be true for me and in my experience, you know, when I focused on that. And that maybe that's why the journaling worked so well for me because um, I didn't really have an audience in mind, you know, or an, or a tangible audience. Um, and, you know, and, and in that case, because it sounds like you're, you're like with your students, you're, you're, this seems like it is with your students. Is this something that you come across commonly? Like, like uh, your students preoccupation with, Perfect, you know, perfection in their writing is what has, have you found as a, a great writing instructor that this is what has stunted the growth of a lot of writers or? Um, You're talking to Mark, right? Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Mark, is that something that you've experienced uh, teaching writing? Is that, is that this idea of perfection? Because, I mean, as a teacher, if you're, if you're a teacher, um, okay, um, like, like if you're like if you're a teacher, you're gonna have you're gonna you're gonna be because uh, this is something that I struggle with as a teacher, not teaching writing, but even the elementary students. That whenever I call upon them to to create some form of self-expression, um, that they're thinking about 
instead of thinking about themselves and how they're going to express it, they're thinking about, well, what does my teacher want to see? Or what would impress my teacher, you know? And so I don't know, like, sometimes I think that uh, it'll be interesting to find out from, from writers who have produced what's close to, to perfect words um, and that they have a universal appreciation of, you know, that a collective universal appreciation. I know you don't like using that word. I don't like using it either, but um, that maybe the, the intention of the writer was not, was not to, to, uh, to project this image or to, ter- or to use their words to project an image of themselves to everyone, you know. Um, you know, I, I found that when words are most perfect is when you're telling your story, when you're telling, you know, that's when I found in some way. And if your words are telling your story in some way, then I think that they're closest to. What, what component does the listener's understanding of your words factor into your satisfaction? Well, if that's if my concern is my listeners' understanding, um, because I know when I'm journaling, I, I really don't give a damn about my listener or my reader at the time. It's a completely selfish endeavor. In fact, I I, I don't want there to be any listener or reader. You know, I don't. I mean, I'm writing for my own pure satisfaction, so I can go back to it in you know seven or eight years, or maybe in a couple months, and look at it and say, huh. Oh, that's how I was thinking at this time. That's how I felt, or that this is what I was going through. And, you know, okay. and it's for me. So. But the framework of this, this cafe is, is basically writing for publication, writing for other people to read. And, and, and what is, what is the relationship there? Is there something, uh, is there such a thing as, expressing yourself perfectly so everybody understand, gets it and my, and my contention is <laughs> if that's your goal good luck mm. well, that's gonna happen i think a lot of writers achieve that Real, good the good good writers great writers do i mean just like marco was talking about parable of the sower we're reading right now um you know there are a lot of words and uh that are expressed in that book that people that many, you know, many different people can relate to and can, and can, you know, you can, sometimes when you can, when some, when a writer creates a character that, um, that, that is, that, that is portraying a certain experience. Okay. And if there are readers out there that have had a similar experience or had similar circumstances and they can resonate and say, Oh, you know, I get that. That's, you know, yeah, you can achieve that. It's, it, you know, it happens a lot. I'm just saying as a writer that, that, my impression, the impression I'm making on the reader is not my, is not my primary concern. It's, it's, it's a concern, but it's not primary. Um, and that's, you know, that's where I found. Um, and I, I, I think that's very valid and, uh, and, and I applaud that. Uh, again, my, my purpose was, to push back on the idea that words, that there's a, a what was it? A, a, the same laws that apply to physics and molecules and whatnot apply to words, that they fit together in such a way that they're perfect. It's a perfect m- marriage of, of words and that if, if that is, uh, something that I just, I have to push back against that a lot for the reasons you say, and, and we've been talking about that we're not going to agree on, on everything. And it can be, it can be accidental, right? Marco. And I, I think it was in the comments somewhere he used it's from war and peace. Tolstoy's drops dripped. That's perfect. But I thought about that. It's a translation. What, what is the Russian? <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect in English, drops dripped. 
glad I'm a museum. That's part of my goal. Well, I remember the translators, uh, Peaver and Volokont. Yeah, yeah. That, they wrote about that They uh, in their foreword. I, I probably won't find it right away. I, I thought I might, but um, their transla- they argue that their translation is better than Austin uh, the, Garnet's the, and the other ones because uh, it more faithfully replicates the Russian uh, construction. But, yeah. But part 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 of the beauty of that phrase is is the the alliteration drops dripped. It's perfect. It is perfect. But it wasn't written that way. I'm sure. I don't know what it is in Russian. I, I want to say I think you I think you're making a good point with respect to the limits of um, the science science based metaphors for literature, uh, because take an equ- an, an equation in 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 physics or even quantum physics, it's not subject to individual interpretation. It really has to be one way or the other. It's either right or wrong in a certain sense from, from most of most equations. Like E equals MC squared is true for everybody. It's, that's the idea. But drop stripped is not true for everybody. Uh, I think that's part of what you're saying. Or it's true in a different way. It, it, it can't be subject to the same um, requirements that a mathematical equation is. I think that's. I think that's a yes, good point. That's that's the essence of of my pushback against quantum field poetics, which uh, it is is fine. I think it's it's, and I said this to Jeffrey. I, the creativity of that idea and thought it's wonderful but it's i think it's easily dismissed this is not valid no offense of course oh i took offense mark i took offense <laughs> well it I, you know it it's va- it's not valid if you if you say that the metaphor is perfect <laughs> well, and, and and I mean, I I was kind of speaking to you, Marco, in that I know you you struggle with finishing projects. Your poem, a theory, uh, you know, and a theory of everybody. Is it a poem? <laughs> That's, that's an that's another project that will be finished that will that will manifest it'll what it's just a matter it's just it's just time the issue is time time is a mother it, that a work has to emerge in time and um there's no no way around that uh it may come in an instant it may come through in an instant but if, if it does it's been building for a long time and Part of, I think, a writer's work is, and this goes also to Michael's point around you not being in control, is being present to the, the process of the unfolding of, of a work with, within oneself because it has to gestate and it has to, it's not just within oneself as an individual, but it comes all through life experience, relationships, events, um, and one has an intuition of where things are going or how things are crystallizing into that, that you can put into language. But until you do the work of showing up and writing and living, then it, it doesn't come. Um, but I think ultimately it does because great works emerge mm-hmm. through exactly that process through, through sticking with it through thick and thin until the damn thing is done. And so um, I think the encouragement to stick with it and to get on with it is um, uh, on point. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, I, I take that personally too, that I know, I know how stuck I am. <laughs> I really do. Um, but the only way to get unstuck is not to get stuck about being stuck. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, Go ahead. Uh, I just want to add in Alan Watts 
because he one time said that thinking was subvocal speech. And you're saying writing is thinking. And an element I'm trying to spin into Marco is, uh, I don't want to put perfection <laughs> on this, but listening like a good musician, you know, to what is coming through, what, how am I breathing? How am I using my hands to quote Ed <laughs> to, uh, to actually write or play the guitar? I think writing is thinking, but, I struggle for I've struggled for a long time in my own process to speak personally to really listening, because part of the reason I struggle with writing is I, my speech, my words, the way I talked was corrected all the time because I had a speech impediment and I struggle with certain words. So I know that's part of my little excuse, <laughs> but, you know, I've worked past it and. The best I can do as far as writing is I love to write haiku because it's simple, compact, and I don't have to go in these long, wordy images. I just, it works for me. So I think, or I feel, how are we listening? What kind of listening are we doing? Like, like I, I love what's going on right here and listening to you, Marco, and, and the exchanges are going. It's really uh, inspired my creativity. Thank you, Mark. I just. Uh, uh... Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's inspired. Um, it's inspired me um, as a reader. I mean, not only has this inspired me um, as, you know, someone who writes, but um, because it's encouraged me in the sense that I can it's OK for it to be a selfish um, process in some sense. Um, and that the more, you know, the more, uh, the more genuine and authentic of myself that I put into it, um, the better. And if it just happens to resonate with people, with other readers, well, that's great too. But I think one of the things um, that I'm trying to say is, is, in, you know, to, it's, it's inspired me to continue in, enjoying the process of writing just for the sake of writing. Um, and, you know, where I don't really have to be be that concerned about perfection, um, but but rather just be concerned about express just you know, like it's like a thought exercise or um, or it's you know it's a way of of just communicating with myself in a sense I guess, um, and it's also made me inspired me to be a a more conscientious reader too, like you know as I'm reading to start looking for and when I come across those words or phrases that that just like sort of it's like the it's like the writer is like coming and sort of like you know and like you know caressing your 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 head and saying yeah you know we share that experience i'm like what well, yeah th those kinds of things you know um to look for that because i come across that a lot in stuff that i read but i don't take the time to appreciate and those words don't have to mean anything else or have or, or have any meaning for anyone else. Um, I think that, you know, I, I think I appreciate the writers who are more concerned with with uh, not 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 an putting in, projecting an image of themselves to the, to the reader or the audience, but that are just writing. Um, that are just writing because it's, it's what they naturally do. Um, it's just a, it's a natural extension of themselves, um, and whether and, and whether it's good or not or perfect has nothing to do with how I interpret it as a reader, really. <laughs> um, uh, you know, if the writer is if the writer is satisfied with his with his work with his creation, um, and you know that's 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 good enough for me, I guess. Um, yeah, it has inspired that. Shall I read some, some good stuff? Just to give you an example, I can read from Infinite Jest. I, I have a whole stack of, of yeah. great, great literature. I mean, yeah, I marked, like I said, you can, you can take Infinite Jest and, and on any page, you're, you're going to find just 
incredible uh, phrasing, words. And, and it can be daunting and, and it can be intimidating in that you, you might say, I can never write like that. And that may be true, but remember the, the outcome was the dude killed himself. So uh, where's my, where's what I wanted to read? Cause I think it ties in all, uh, but we like, were. Why do you have to search, Mark? I have like a gazillion. Yeah, I understand, but you should be. A, oh, just dip it, just like in the Bible. Just open it up, point to a verse, I, I, guide I your day. So okay. just point to it and read it. <laughs> but this one I actually selected for you, Ed, because it has ger it has German in it. it. It's for for anybody who has their copy, page six ninety four. <laughs> halfway down can you all hear me am I coming through loud and clear yes right. it's of some interest that the lively arts of the millennial USA treat and hedonia and internal emptiness as hip and cool it's maybe the vestiges of the romantic glorification of Weltschmerz which me, how do you say? Weltschmerz. Yes. Which means world weariness or hip ennui. Maybe it's the fact that most of the arts here are produced by world weary and sophisticated older people and then consumed by younger people who not only consume art, but study it for clues on how to be cool, hip, and keep in mind that for kids and younger people, to be hip and cool is the same as to be admired and accepted and included and so unalone. Forget so-called peer pressure. It's more like peer hunger, no? We enter a spiritual puberty where we snap to the fact that the great transcendent horror is loneliness, excluded Encagement in the self. Once we've hit this age, we will now give or take anything, wear any mask to fit, be part of, not be alone, we young. The U.S. arts are our guide to inclusion. A how to. We are shown how to fashion masks of ennui and jaded irony at a young age where the face is fictile enough to assume the shape of whatever it wears. And then it's stuck there, the weary cynicism that saves us from gooey sentiment and unsophisticated naivety. Sentiment equals naivety on this continent, at least since the reconfiguration. One of the things sophisticated writer viewers have always liked about J.O. Incandenza, the American century as seen through, as seen through a brick, <laughs> is its unsubtle thesis that naivety is the last true terrible sin in the theology of millennial America. And since sin is the sort of thing that can be talked about only figuratively, it's natural that himself's dark little cartridge was mostly about a myth. V's that queerly persistent U.S. myth that cynicism and naivety are mutually exclusive. What year did he write that? It published in 96, and he was writing it for, I don't know, about three years prior in a little cabin up, up in upstate New York. And it, as with Oronsky and what's her name? Jennifer Lawrence. I think his main inspiration for writing the book was he wanted to, to uh, impress, what's her name? Mary Carr, in my opinion. Mm. And in, in that paragraph, it's just, 
it's almost a, a book in itself that, that the things, that a lot of it spoke to what you were talking of earlier, Katrina, about the masks and all, all the stuff. It's just amazing. And that's one page of 1,337 pages. And it has nothing to do with the plot. There is no plot. It's just a guy putting incredible words together. Sometimes <laughs> it's just, it, it's not a perfect work, but there are just incredible passages in it. Yeah, I found a lot of them too. I mean, without even having to read the book, <laughs> this is what's interesting, without even having read the book, you can, look, you can uh, skim through and pull out it, on any given page, anywhere, a quotation that, um, that I could identify with. You know, um, so I can only speak for myself. <laughs> and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of like dark humor in there too. Um, like he says, um, uh, and just little, like he says that the uh, the truth will set you free, but not until it is finished with you. <laughs> you know, and then in the sense like what you were saying today about perfection, he he even addresses that. He says one of his quotes. He says, um, "You'll become way less concerned with what other people think of you when you realize how seldom they do." And um, and I think, <laughs> well, I mean, and in a sense, that's that's, true. that's kind of that's the, true. That's true. That's the philosophy I sort of I take into into writing is like um, you know, why am I going to let let what other people are going to think uh, paralyze me when we you know people these people don't really you know I'm not really thought of that much you know people don't really think of think of us or are they're not as concerned with our image. The image we project as we think they are, and um, so why spend so much energy and creative, waste so much creative time on um, being concerned with what other people think? Because I, I, I think, from what you've been saying, I think that that first part of that of that quote summarizes what gets some sometimes maybe what gets people stuck with the perfect words is you know is really being concerned with what other people will think. Um, and that's something that I had to free myself of in order to really write. Um, and then if it just happens to resonate with people, well, then that's magic. That's great <laughs> that it did. But that wasn't the objective. Um, and because, you know, you're talking about wanting to be published on, your, on one hand and then, and then great writing on the other. And, you know, sometimes it, it, takes, it takes a lot of time for those two for those two worlds to connect. Um, so yeah, I, I I think that you know what I'm going to take away from this when it comes to uh, in, in terms of writing is is just pretty much that quote. You know, I'm going to become less concerned with what other people think of, and I'm going to put in there in a um, in in sort of like parentheses, other people think of your writing when you realize how so how seldom they do. Um, and I don't know. I think that 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 realization is is, is can be can be kind of freeing for a writer. You know? so, yeah, he's got some great stuff. He says, um, I guess he's talking to the character Mario. He says, um, not not um, yeah, Mario. Okay, not Mark and Mario. Mario, what do you get when you um cross an insomnia, an unwilling agnostic, and a dyslexic? And Mario's like, I get. It. He says. He gets home and stays up all night torturing himself mentally over the question of whether or not there's a dog. <laughs> so maybe that book makes your your top five. Huh? Maybe that book makes your top five. Apparently you've yeah, read it. I, I, I definitely know that I have to read it now. <laughs> definitely. Um, he's got a listener. He's got a listener of the year. Yeah, maybe it will. It's just a shame that such that such wonderful words. Um, I don't know how you know that it just it's just tragic that these words, which are so inspiring to other people and like you know and and like life affirming, uh, contributed to his his self destruction. I guess that, that I don't understand. I mean, go ahead, Michael. I was just going to say, um, referring back to my um, self-consciousness of words and speech and learning to get somewhat past it, 
the little hidden thing for me was worrying about what they think is trying to control what they think. And that gets in the way of me being speaking from my heart. I want to hear what people think, but I've chosen very carefully the people I can, <laughs> I want to hear what they think, like along the lines of this group, because I know that how they listen and how they respond has a certain quality I need to kind of bounce off. Well, is, does this make sense or how's it, how's this land on you? You know? So I really, when I had that insight that worry was a type of controlling how pe other people think, and that interfered with me being in touch with my genius or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> you know, uh, the intuition listening to what words do I want to bring forth? Because I had, self-consciousness that if I didn't bring the perfect words, I was going to get corrected. I They're not going to listen to what I said. They want to correct. Oh, you said ax instead of ask, you know, and, and totally miss the connection I'm trying to make with them. So it, I had to process that for a long time of going, no matter what, no matter how I say it, I'm going to say it. You either get it or you don't. Ed. I like un that. I like un that. Unmute yourself, Ed. <laughs> oh. I, thought I did unmute myself. <laughs> how, Please. How, did, how did Wallace do on the definition of that German word? that I can't say. He missed it. But that's beside, it's really beside the point because the way he used the word was correct for the context that it was put in. But the word actually means literally world pain. And Weltschmerz is when you carry the pain of the entire world on your own shoulders. That's how I interpreted what he... Yeah, but he says right after that, it's, it's world sorrow. It's not sorrow. It's pain. It's pain. Pain is not sorrow. Well, okay. I can't here, not pain. well here we here here we go with words. Well, I, I agree, and that's why sorrow. I wanted to go back to what what he had said because it, it, it's it is a nice it was a nice paragraph, but like you keep pointing out, there's no book. He's got this collection of aphorisms. Why didn't he just write a collection of aphorisms? He does in one <laughs> section. Well, yeah, you, yeah, but you can make people have made whole philosophies out of just writing aphorisms. Einstein <laughs> became famous because he doesn't write anything longer than about thirty words at a time. You can, you can do it, and it's about saying, expressing a thought in a very understandable or listenable way. Well, we'll just do that. I think he missed the whole point because he he put it in a novel. That turns out really isn't a novel, which is why I wouldn't read it, because <laughs> without a story, it won't. I would, but I wanted to go to the other side of that. The, the last book, the last novel I read, I just finished the day before yesterday, was The Sorrows of Young Werther. I read it in German. It's a novel by Goethe. It was written in 1781. And he recounts, it's just a series of letters that this guy writes to his friends. And at the end, he commits suicide. And this novel, this, this collection of letters, launched a wave of suicides of young people across Europe. And in, in what, what year? 1781. Are we? In 1780. A wave of suicides. People went out and just started offing themselves after reading this book. Wow. Yeah, that, that's that's what I thought too, because I'm sitting here, I'm reading it, and I didn't feel suicidal at the end, but I understood, I believe, very well. And he didn't he didn't just pull the trigger. It was one of those front loader things he had to use. It was in 1781, you know. And so he used a pistol and it took him 24 hours to die. But it's only described that it's the most powerful part of the book. It's two pages long. But it's got a completely different effect because any one of those letters, any one of the phrase, there's things in there that are quotable little quotes, no doubt about it. But it was the impact of the whole that actually made the effect. 
because it was constructed as a whole, because it was a complete, it had a completeness about it. That's, and that's the perfection that Michael has, has made reference to. It's this completeness. It's, there's blemishes. It's not, a, it's not perfect in the sense that I couldn't find fault with things that he said or how he phrased them. That, that's beside the point. But the effect itself at the end was very magnificent. Now, I wouldn't have called it perfect. No. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to have to uh, uh, speak to a couple things. One, the distinction between pain and sorrow. If sorrow is in the title, but generally people don't off themselves because they're sad or, you know, feeling sorrowful. But pain, pain is, can be unbearable. Well, and here's the thing. I have a quibble with the, with the person who, who gave it the title that we all know? The sorrow. Did you read it in German or was it a translation? I read it. No, I read it in German. It was, and it's called "Die Leiden des Jungen Wieders," and Leiden is actually suffering, not sorrow. But Leiden can be a sorrow in certain contexts, and so that's how the translator. When so, when you read something in translation, I don't care what it is, you're reading a different book. And you should read that book and accept that book as it is. And I understand that the translation from of uh, you know War and Peace should be should be this one because it's closer to the original Russian. But none of us are Russians, so none of us have that cultural background that allows us to feel our way into how they put words together. You know, Katrina was saying in my earlier. You know, the, the wisdom writings of the Bible or the Psalms, they are different when you read them in Hebrew than if you read them in English translation. It's, it's a different book. It, it has little to do with what we know. Now, what we know is enriching and inspiring, and it's a part of our culture, and you, you can't read anything. And I would be willing to bet that, that the infinite jest is full of biblical references. Consciously and unconsciously put in there. They're there. You can't avoid them. This was Northrop Fry's entire argument about about uh, Western literature. You actually can't understand it without having without without an understanding of the Bible. And most people's understanding of the Bible is what they've got from literature, not from reading the Bible. It turns out because everybody quotes it, and everybody uses it, and everybody kicks it around. But it's that tra- it's that translation. It's what we understand it to be in our cultural sphere, so to speak. But it's not, it's not the original. It's, 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 it's different when you get, get into the original. And that's why I find reading things, if, I can find, if, it's a, if it was written by a German, and since I can read German, I'd rather read it in German. Because it just, sure. it just gets to the point quicker. You know, I don't have to try and figure out, well, what did he really mean and what was behind Is, it? And, and I, I have no idea. So I'm asking the question. Is there such a thing as alliteration in German? Oh yes! Sure. Oh yeah! Oh yes! They they would say tropfen tropfen. Drip drip. Yeah, see, it, it's the same word. It, it's repeated. It's 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 not drip drips. You know, it's it's tropfen tropfen. <laughs> so it is an alliteration, but it doesn't have necessarily that same impact that it might have with us, depending on where it, where it's placed and how it comes. You know, why is it there? It's. And so, you know, any, that's why I, I love the idea of, of perfect words, because I'm fundamentally, for many different reasons, of your opinion. There are no per- perfect words. There are only these words that we use in this context that had an effect that made an impression on s- someone. Did you ever quote something from a book to someone, and they looked at you like you just arrived from Mars? <laughs> and you thought it was the greatest oh, yeah. thing you'd ever read? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I walk around this house and go, you got to listen to this. I say that to my wife. And she just looked at me and went, let's go back to your room. No. <laughs> but, it was, but it was moving for me and powerful for me and important at that point for me. Because it's that context in which that arises, that the meaning comes. And that's the thing that you're getting at. And that's the thing I, where we agree most. It has to make some kind of sense. And any one of these passages from Infinite just makes sense as that passage. 
it just might not completely fit into a hole or whatever it is. My feeling is he should have written a different kind of book. But that's just my opinion. See? Don't make it a novel. Write a book of aphorisms. <laughs> but, but the effects that th this has and how it affects us can be very far reaching because I am sure that when Mr. Uh, von Goethe wrote his novel, he didn't think that there were a lot of people who were just going to go out and shoot themselves. And they did. They mimicked what he had done. No. This, this was, and knowing full well, having read this, it's not going to work the first time. No. That, that's a part that has, just actually boggles my mind about the thing. Well, and also the power of language. Power well, exactly. There's something in all of those words as they were put together that was greater than the sum of the parts that were there. Yeah. Because if you read any one of these letters that's in there, you're going, well, okay, that's a, it's a, it's like a thing to say, I'm also a, I, I do a lot of journal writing, but it's there. And, and, uh, and they read a lot like things I would have written. It's like, uh, I wasn't impressed. <laughs> a, a curiosity, was it? Letters between uh, lovers, and then no, it was a broken is, art. Letters. The the person the person who in the end committed suicide wrote letters to his best friend, and we never see and never read what the best friend wrote to him. We only see the letters that he wrote to this best friend. It's a one sided correspondence, as if he were writing to us. To the reader, so to speak, because you're the only one that's involved. But you and you get to know the the person through his letters, and so you enter into a relationship with the writer of the letters, as it is. It, it's a it's a fascinating little book. Well, absolutely, I don't know how it is in English. I'm I'm half tempted to get it in English just to see how they did with the translation, to see if it has that same kind of effect. You know. I'd be interested in, in you doing that and letting us know. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you one thing. It's only 150 pages long. So, uh, so there is the possibility that I might do something like that. Say, I'm not going to do 1,300 pages. What, it, just that description, and I and I just been browsing it, reminds me of Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls. Bell tolls. He just, yeah, you're yeah. just inside this one guy's head. Yes. And yeah. there's, there's dialogue, but really you just get one. You, you get one of, perspective. You get uh, one point of view. Yeah. It, it's a, and it's a, it's a very fascinating. It's, it's so, you know, Hemingway doesn't have a new technique or a new device that he, this is something that's been around for a while. That you can take this single perspective and, and let and let the world unfold, and you get a you get a look inside there, and you get to to go along with that. But it is a story, in my view, because it has a beginning, middle, and end. For whom the bell tolls, you see. I, and I'm I'm real hung up on story. I really like to know this is going somewhere. You know, I like I like plot and I like character, whereby any one of them can be very very much reduced. It can be Minimal, yes. you know, it doesn't have to be the main thing. So when you're in a one guy's head, there's not a lot of plot going on. There's certain a lot of a lot of characterization, but it does follow some chronology so that we get from here to there. We get from where he fell in love with it. He he committed suicide because of his love for this woman that he could never have. Very classic story. <laughs> 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 yeah, even that's not, but it's based on personal experience too. Mm -hmm. you know, we we all know that unrequited love thing, and and unrequited not because the person that we love wouldn't want to, it's because for whatever reason, socially, culturally, politically, they can't. You know, Romeo and Juliet springs to mind. Yeah, it's it, it, they're old story. I think I have one book over here on my show. I don't know if you ever read it. Seven Basic Plots. And and this guy wrote, and he said, there are seven well. Plots. well, he says there's seven. Okay, <laughs> there's seven plots. And every story ever written, you can fit into one of these schemes. But whatever. It, it's also too long to read all the way to the end. You know, if it's seven, then I don't need to have a thousand pages of seven. <laughs> so, 
kind of thing. But it, but we do have very fundamental stories and storylines that we that we work with, and 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 it is creative in a, in a way when we deviate from those and we. We, 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 you know, we break the rules and the first couple of times people do that, everybody thinks it's nice and then it becomes a fad and then everybody's doing it. And then who cares anymore? You know, and, and by the time those of us who have trouble managing the time to get anything done to the end, by the time our come out, the fat, the fad trains moved on anyway. <laughs> so, you know, we were going to miss that. You know? So, you know, you, you always have to have to say, okay, well, what is it that I'm right? You know, Am I writing something timeless? Maybe that's a question that comes up in some people's minds. Maybe that's a hindrance. I'm just kind of reflecting on my own practice. I have lots of things I'd like to do. I just don't have any time. That, really? That's the, that's, really? Yeah. <laughs> really? Really. I haven't had time all my life. <laughs> no. And I'm a person that got up at 4 o'clock every morning and didn't go to bed before midnight. For 40 years. Wow. I don't have any, I had no time. It was full. Wow. I, I, I suffer that myself. So. Right. But I was, I was just speaking about that this morning <laughs> with my psych girl. <laughs> oh, I feel time running out. Yeah. But that's probably been, in, I probably felt that way since I was three years old. <laughs> well, we have had that, and we've also been in a situation where it, where it is running, where it is, there's just not a lot at, at one's disposal. You know, I, I'm pretty sure Marco will, will bear me out on this. There's just lots of things to get in the way. Sometimes you just need a block of time to do something. Other people, God damn it. God, yeah, yeah. The world would be a great place if it weren't for other people. <laughs> of course, again. Yeah. Most of them. What you're right. Yeah, I know. See? That, that's part of that compromise. But but finding that time, you know, it's not, I, I, I've always, you know, inspiration's not the problem. For some people, that seems to be a problem. I, that's not my problem. I have ideas all the time. But implementing them, getting them put together, finding the time to actually sit down and work them through, that's 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 the real challenge. You know? That's and I can't get just I'm retired and I have no time. Because everybody else thinks they have time for me. <laughs> I, I, I still live in I still live in a commune <laughs> of six other people who realize oh well it's got time he's retired well it doesn't have time he's retired <laughs> <laughs> so anyway that's beside the point but um, I just wanted to, uh, we were going to share five books and we didn't get to do it. But one book that's really impressed me, especially lately, is by Ursula Le Guin called uh, Words Are My Matter. And how she put those together is perfect in my eyes. <laughs> that's perfect because words tend to be a big part of my my life, whether it's written or, you know, talking to other people. And, and I've constantly had to struggle with the uh, – intersection of control and care because of some childhood upbringing they're not the same mm -hmm. but some people misconstrue care for control as i have but i've learned that that's not necessarily the case so it's helped i that that title just helped me it verified okay mike yeah words matter to you it's kind of like a self <laughs> You had to own that, Mike. <laughs> but there's a double meaning in that, too. She yeah, says, yeah. Words are my matter in the way that a, a physicist might say that <laughs> works are. <laughs> That's right, Marco. That's right. That's right. Uh, um, I wanted just to ref uh, reflect, tie a few things together. If I, last thing I'll say, but uh, the, the title, the translation uh, of the title of, the, of Goethe's book, the sorrows versus the suffering, it's so mm -hmm. different if it's the suffering. Because if it's yes. the sorrows, it suggests maybe, uh, you know, a dilettante or somebody who is, um, you know, not really feeling it is more melodramatic or uh, mm -hmm. more immature. Uh, and suffering is something that cuts to the heart of human experience. So that, that uh, I think, is a, a very significant uh, difference. Um, the fact of the effect that that book had culturally on other people's psyche, I think is really significant as well. 
course, books do this, and that's part of the magic of books is that they can have these non-local transtemporal uh, effects. Uh, and for that reason, I wanted to tie back to something that Katina had said earlier about, you know, the feeling of, well, who do my words matter to? This is what, uh, you know, you, you referred to also, Mark. Um, we, you know, that, that we think, expect, think other people are thinking about us a lot more than they actually are. But the thing with words that are put together with intention and that capture a certain truth is that they do end up mattering to others. And even if it's not a bestseller or, or you know, affecting millions of people, it may just be one or two or 10 or 100 other, other people for whom, if those words are well-crafted, are clear, are transmissive of that emotional, moral uh, state or idea that the author has, it's very significant that the words are what they are, that, it's, that, that the, in order for them to be effective, the translation from the author's own interior to the audience, the listener, has to be precise. And, and I would actually argue, metaphorically at least, that the kind of discipline that a scientist brings to a mathematical equation to, or to an engineering project, to sending uh, humans to the moon, that a great artist brings a similar, not the same, but a similar discipline and precision even to their work with words, to their work with their matter. So um, I, I think that I mean, part of what I am circling around in some way is the fear that we have of our own greatness, of our own access to divine inspiration or genius. And you know, the, the way that we don't make the time for it because insofar as we all do have access to it, insofar as we all can um, feel it, 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 there, there, there's a step beyond where, it, where you can bring it from within to without. And that takes the work of finding the right words. And they don't necessarily come immediately. Uh, it may feel natural, but the word, you may have a strong feeling, but the, you may not have the words for it. And it may take a while until you have the, the words for it. Um, so just... Uh, I wanted to kind of bring that home in some way, but um, there's a, there is both the element of truth and of craft because part of what an artist does is they are working as a kind of magician. Uh, and in magic, the right words versus the wrong words are like a spell that works versus a spell that doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, maybe there's not a perfect word, but it has to work and has to have an effect. And as the writer, even if you don't have a particular audience in mind that you're trying to construct an artificial self for, you are aware of the effect of words because you're feeling them in your own body. Like when you yes, say words that yes. work, you feel a flow. I feel a flow. And it's not a constrained flow like it works intellectually. No, it works because it invokes the reality, the inspiration, the truth, the 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 ten the 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 tactile the ten tangible sense of the scene that you are attempting to convey. Um, I want to go back now to Tolstoy. I found the no the translation. <laughs> this is what they say, and it's really interesting to describe to to study the translation because in a way, the author is the first translator. They're translating from their inner experience to a, a language. That can be shared. Um, and that can happen in many different ways, but it makes a difference how it happens. It absolutely makes a difference. They're talking about Tolstoy's style and his sentences. This is uh, the translators who are Richard P. Pevier and Larissa Volokonsky. They're excellent translators. The other extreme of Tolstoy's style is exemplified by the short sentence the shortest in War and Peace, that I have already quoted, drops, drift. It is the first sentence of a paragraph made up of four brief staccato sentences, four quite ordinary observations, which acquire a lyrical intensity owing solely to the sound and rhythm of the words. In Russian, kapli, kapali. 
with a K, Kapli Kapali, Shiol Tiki Gobor. I don't speak Russian. <laughs> this is t- probably totally wrong. Loshadi Zarzali i Podrailis Krapel Kto Kto. Drops dripped. This is the translation. Drops dripped. Quiet talk went on. Horses neighed and scuffled. Someone snored. End quote. It is a night scene and one of the most haunting moments in the book. This is a war, not, you know, the, all the scenes in the camps and, you know. Uh, uh, first sentence. All right, so the, now the, the other English versions translate the first sentence as the branches dripped, the trees were dripping, or closer to the Russian, raindrops dripped. They all state a fact instead of rendering a sound, which, by a stroke of translator's luck, comes out almost the same in English as in Russian. So they, they went through these other translations and they said, it doesn't sound right. It doesn't convey that feeling in the middle in the, at night when you hear drops dripping. And they struck upon, I would argue, the perfect translation. <laughs> there may be other perfect translations as well uh that's not to say it's the only perfect translation but i would argue comparing it to the others well i i i wouldn't disagree that that is yeah that you you read that or hear it read and you're blown away it, how could it be improved upon? Uh, you know, I I put in the comments that the Wallace sentence, smiling, simply snapped Gately's spine. Mm-hmm. Who would ever think to put those words together? <laughs> but it, it, I would argue it works perfectly. Mm-hmm. Works very well. Somebody who was obsessed. Yeah. <laughs> and who who, no, it's, no, who and else would word. ever think of putting those right. words and, together? And, that, and it's that it's that complete the completeness that comes across. This is where I'm, I'm back. I'm with Michael on this one. That that whole sense of completeness. That it's the Germans would say it's round. <laughs> that, that, wow. that phrase is round. When something's round, that's good. It's just it's, it's good. It, it'll roll. <laughs> I like that. I like yeah, that. That, that, that. That's the way they would describe it. You know? I like that. But they also use the word "round" to describe a good a good wine, where the, ah. where the where the acids and the and the sourness is well blended in with the fruit. That is uh, the vine is rund. You see? <laughs> that's, oh. that's music to my ears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So round so we're 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 yeah, at the end round, of the, we we're, we're at the end of the hour, and uh, I'm curious if if anybody else wants to share their five best books. Marco, Ed, anyone? Michael? I, yes, I I'll, I'll, even... I'll share mine. I'll share mine. Okay. I I I I I was thinking in in terms of novels for the most part. I did not include. Um, Simply because it was the last one I read, but it it, it qualifies the uh, sorrows. I know, of the young there, that last that number five spot is. <laughs> um, but the one the ones that I wrote down were Slaughterhouse Five by Vonnegut, Glass Bead Game by Hesse, mm-hmm. Franny and Zooey by Salinger, Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, and a book I love to hate, Snow Crash by. Uh, Neil Stevenson. So, I've heard of some of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't go down the obscure path. I only picked the ones in response to the question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whereby I would I would also say that the glass bead game is, as far as I'm concerned, better in German than it is in English. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, I'm. I can't give you my five. I feel like I still haven't read all the great books. I took this as the five way. at the moment. It could change at any at any 
time. Uh, I can I could name a handful. Uh, the Dispossessed by by Le Guin, uh, Ursula Le Guin, The Dispossessed. Dahlgren by Samuel Delaney. I'll throw up at Infinite Jest on there as well, David Foster Wallace. Thus Spake Zarathustra mm. Nietzsche. Yeah. And there's one more. I think I might have to leave the last one open. I'm looking at my bookshelf, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, so we'll see. We'll see what the last one might be. I'm going to leave number five open. The, I think that that would be TBD. the... To be determined. TBD. <laughs> Here, Tina, you want to go? I, I already did. I um, talked about my five favorites. Um, at the, I think um, at the beginning of... Yeah, yeah. Middle, yeah. Mm -hmm. I like Bonnet. Okay. I love Slaughterhouse. I, I, yeah, that when I read that, it oh, made yeah. me read all of Bonnet. <laughs> I just love <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, mine is uh, In Favor of the Sensitive Man and Other Essays by Anais Nin. Mm -hmm. Fear of Flying with Erica Jong. The Life According to Carp by John Irving, and Even Cowgirls Get the Blues, Tom Robbins. Good ones. Oh. I, What's your five? Uh, mine? All right, here we go. Uh, Sometimes a Great Notion, Ken mm. Kesey, yeah. Infinite Jess, David Foster Wallace, War and Peace, Tolstoy, Gone with the Wind, Margaret Mitchell. And the fifth one is brand new. It's called Training to Be Myself, a indulgent odyssey of confessions, no, obsessions, confessions, and, and curiosities, and that's written by my son. And wow. I've, not, I've not read a word of it. Mm. The, that makes sense. The, the title is extraordinary. The cover artwork is extraordinary. And he, he and I clash a lot, but he's like my best student. He, mm. he did it. Oh, wow. Nice. Nice, so, Mark. Can you hold it up, Mark? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I fr I framed I, I don't have the book. I framed the the, the yeah it's back okay. it's a, a, a training to be myself. He took a, a a train trip around the United States doing his improv uh, thing and. And it's reflections, well, obsessions, curiosities, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and uh, I, the title just is is fabulous. It just speaks to what you're going to find inside. Like I said, I haven't read a word of it, but I know he worked on it for a couple of years, and uh, you know, I just give him the encouragement that I hope I gave, you know, aspiring writers throughout the universe who are watching this. <laughs> well, thanks, Mark. That was cool. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Thank you. Right, Pleasure. Everybody. I enjoyed it. See you, Ed. Tina. Nice, okay. time. Uh, nice time, Bye. all. Nice time. It was Bye -bye. good. Bye. All right. Later. Bye-bye.